Hey everybody, so today I just, I'm going to answer some questions, but first I just want to show you these awesome bunny ears. So after Easter every year, we, I didn't wear them, Branson wore these things, but um, every year after Easter, like after the religious part of Easter, I guess you could say, we have the Easter bunny hunt. So the Easter bunny visited them out last week and Branson wore these ears and found his little Easter basket. It's like jelly beans and chocolates and not too much sugar, but just enough to have fun. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so I'm going to answer some of your questions. It's bunny ears there. Okay. So, of course, I always get really good questions from you guys. So, um, hold on while I just bring them up. Okay. So for the first one here, I love your videos. Thanks for making them. Do you think intentional community is better suited for those who are extroverts or introverts? <laughs> um, okay, so that's a great question. I've, I've actually gotten this a couple times, but the beautiful thing about community is that I think it can be actually very well suited to any personality type. So, um, but even more than that, uh, community needs different kinds of people and it's actually at its best when each person is free to be the individual that God created them to be. So the extrovert, who has a lot of outgoing energy and thrives on talking and connecting with other people, is needed just as much as the introvert, who is able to listen and empathize with others and um, get their energy and inspiration from times of solitude and reflection. Um, I would say here at the Bruderhof, we have pretty much every personality type you could think of, and that definitely keeps life from getting too boring. So not everyone is like me, thank goodness. <laughs> Actually, my mom often used to say, we can only handle one Laura, so. Um, but of course, she loves me, so that's enough about me. So the next question is, with your mention of Bruderhof communities around the world, I was surprised that Canada wasn't mentioned. And that led me to a Google search and pausing your video for 20 minutes while I searched for a Canadian Bruderhof and surprisingly found none. What I did find is that the Bruderhof once had a connection of sorts to the Hutterites, which I'm a little familiar with as there are about 370 of their communities in Canada. Maybe sometime you can do a video on the difference between the two communities. So I am proud to say that I am actually a direct descendant of the Hutterites. My grandfather, um, Dan Mendel, he was born and raised in a Hutterite colony in Manitoba, Canada. And then he came to the Bruderhof as a young man where he met my grandmother. And they had nine sons, and one of them is my dad, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, but back to the real history um, between the Bruderhof and the Hutterites, it goes way back to the very beginning of our communities, and it's fascinating. So I did a little research, and I'll just try to give a little overview for you. So way back in the 1500s, there was a man named Jacob Hutter, or we often call him Jakob Hutter because the J, you make it sound like a Y when you're speaking German or one of those languages. So Jakob Hutter, um, he was an Anabaptist or a rebaptizer, as they were called, because they believed that people should freely choose to be baptized as adults rather than as infants, which was practiced by the institutional church at the time. Um, at that time, the Anabaptists were being persecuted by the authorities, which was the institutional church, um, for their beliefs. But despite this, many of them gathered and kept gathering and began to live in full community, which was under Jakob Hutter's leadership. So um, they were following the example of the first Christians described in the book of Acts. Eventually, because the institutional church felt threatened by this growing movement, Hutter was actually arrested and tried and sentenced to death, and he was burned at the stake for his beliefs. But the community movement lived on, and some of their descendants eventually settled in Canada and the northwestern part of this country of the U.S. And then, so we'll fast forward a few hundred years to Germany in the 1920s. Um, Eberhard Arnold, who founded the Bruderhof, um, he started, it was started small, obviously. <laughs> um, but he was incredibly inspired by the early Christians and he was researching them and he trying to learn about any other communal movement he could find. So he found out that the Hutterites still existed and he was so excited that he traveled all the way to North America by ship, mind you, and he left his 
wife and five young children, um, as well as the small community that he had just founded, um, behind. And he spent a year with the Hutterites and on their communities. So we have learned a lot from the Hutterites. And although we are not formally connected with them, we share the same heritage and the same faith. And as I said in the beginning, there are many of us who live here at the Bruderhof now who wouldn't be around if it wasn't for that connection. So if any of you Hutterites are watching, hey there. <laughs> okay, sorry, my phone timed out. Such a long answer. Okay, so next question is, it's a really good question. Have you already talked about mental health in the Bruderhof? I was wondering if there are some people who experience stress, anxiety, or depression and would benefit from professional help or medication. If that is the case, is there a stigma associated with the mental health struggles? So just like anywhere else, there are people on our communities who have mental health challenges. And in addition to daily support from family and community members, those who need to also receive professional help in the form of counseling or therapy or medication, I wouldn't say that there is a stigma associated with it. Um, because I've always understood that there are different kinds of illnesses or crosses that people have to bear. Some are physical, like cancer, for example, and others are mental or emotional, like depression or anxiety. And then, so then in addition to professional medical help, of course we pray for people who are struggling and believe that Jesus is actually the great physician. So um, I actually have a, a good friend, someone who I worked with for a couple of years who who often struggled um, mentally and emotionally, and it definitely helped me to learn compassion. So just a little anecdote there. Okay, so another, actually it's a related question, is I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about being asked to move. As a psychologist, I'm aware that some people might find it too incredibly st stressful to move, to make such a change, to move away from family and close friends. It isn't simply a matter of attitude, but of anxiety, stability, relationships that ground a person. Can one say no, or is there a recognition that a move may simply not be good for some people's mental health? So absolutely. There are people who have lived at the same community for decades, um, sometimes because of mental health, but also because not everyone moves the whole time. <laughs> um, so yes, it's important to be willing to move if we're needed somewhere else. But at the same time, each move is very carefully considered and thought through before it happens. Also with like each person or family situation kept in mind, and people don't just move unless it's really necessarily, like it's not like we're being uprooted every half year. So I hope that answers your question. So the next question is, are there many people living there with you who haven't taken the vows that you have? Are there residents who are not official members, kind of like lay members? I don't mean the folks that visit for two weeks. I mean serious residents who haven't committed for life yet. So a great question to which I will answer yes. And then I'm going to tell a little story about a man named Lee. So. When I was growing up at, the, at Woodcrest, which is our community in Rifton, New York, Lee was the guy who mowed the lawns in the summer and snow plowed the roads in winter. And he also ran the community's water treatment plant. And when people moved house, he would pull up with his truck and help move furniture and stuff. Anyway, he lived in one of our small apartments and he sometimes came to worship meetings on Sundays, but not very often because he didn't really like big crowds but he sure loved to join different families for dinner, like in their homes. So Lee was a Vietnam vet, and he had seen and done a lot of horrific things during the war. And this affected him for the rest of his life, and he was so wounded by these experiences that he actually ended up losing his wife and children. And he always said that he could never forgive himself for what he had done. I won't tell, like, the whole story now, like how he came to the community, it's, it's really amazing in itself. But suffice it to say that he was completely part of Woodcrest for well over 15 years. He was never a member and he didn't even consider himself a religious person, although he did have a deep love for the Native American people and, and their respect for Mother Nature. Um, but he looked out for people in a very practical way, um, without a lot of fanfare, 
And looking back, I think he followed the commands of Jesus probably more truly and fully than many of us do. So that's probably like a roundabout way of answering the question about people living with, with us who haven't taken um, lifetime vows. Although I should also add that Lee's example is unique to him and it's not like there are a lot of people who live here who haven't made a commitment. Um, but there are those who definitely stay long term who want to seek with us to be a full part of our communities. So I think, yeah, that's all the questions I have for today. But keep asking more questions and keep enjoying the spring and hopefully I'll do a video about striper season or at least I'll post some pictures on my community tab because right now it's striped bass season so basically they're doing their run up the Hudson River and our family's really into it we spend hours by the river so see you next time have a great day